Welcome, welcome to the closing session of this World Economic Forum in East Asia. And I first have the pleasure and honor to welcome Prime Minister Abhishek among us. Prime Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister, we appreciate very much your participation. We know you are in the midst of an election campaign. Uh, the World Economic Forum is an impartial, non-political organization, but I think you, I can state that you have uh, many admirers in this room uh, looking at the economic progress of this country in a difficult situation after the crisis has, uh, has been made under your leadership, but also the political stabilization which has happened after um, the turmoil which we wit witnessed in your country. So um, again, we are very grateful that despite all the um, burden on your shoulders, uh, you are here with us today. And I hear it must be like a relaxation because normally you make seven to eight um, speeches a day in this election campaign. So today it's one speech at the end of this panel discussion. I also have uh, the pleasure to welcome um, a uh, figure which, uh, political figure or international figure whom I don't have to present very much, who plays a major role in the world. It's Pascal Lamy, the Director General of the WTO. Now, we have the co-chairs assembled here. And I just run again uh, through the list of um, um, our distinguished co-chairs, it's Karin Agustavan, the President, Director General, Chief Executive Officer of Pertamina, uh, Dominic Parton, the Worldwide Managing Director of McKinsey and Company, Stuart Gulliver, who is the Group Chief Executive of HSP, Paul Polman, the Chief Executive Officer of Unilever, and Shehat Sutarja, uh, the Chairman and President and Chief Executive of Maxwell, Marwell Technology Group. So we have all kinds of industries here. My first question would be, what do you take out as a conclusion of uh, this meeting? But be, so you can think about it, but before you take the floor, I would like um, Pascal Lamy to tell us the latest about where we stand in global trade issues. Thanks, uh, Klaus. Uh, well, let me start with your first question. Uh, what did I learn listening to uh, <coughs> this uh, Indonesian hosted session of the WEF? Uh, is one main conclusion, uh, which is that uh, open regionalism works. Uh, this is not an oxymoron. Countries in this region have uh, succeeded during, let's say, the last uh, two decades, both in integrating their economies thanks to technological progress, thanks to a series of measures that have to do with uh, trade, while keeping uh, the diversity of their identities. And this is something which in many ways can be a lesson uh, for the rest of the world. Now, of course, countries in this region uh, have not done it the sort of EU way. There was not a sort of grand design of political integration, hence economic integration, hence trade integration. They've done it in a very pragmatic way, sort of step by step, the Asian way. And if you look at 
trade, they've successfully combined progressive market opening, trade facilitation, i.e. customs procedures, streamlining, uh, simplifying uh, visa requirement, uh, making sure that uh, professionals in uh, architecture, health can circulate more freely, and in building a trade capacity among the less developed countries of the region. Uh, if I take the example of uh, w WTO accessions, for instance, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand shouldered the accession of Cambodia and Vietnam to the WTO. And now Vietnam is shouldering the accession of Lao PDR to the WTO. So there is a capacity and experience of experience sharing, uh, which I think works very well. Second lesson, and this uh, brings me, Klaus, to your uh, second question. The way this region has integrated uh, trade-wise uh, teaches us lesson of what the multilateral system should be about in the future, <laughs> i.e., of course, opening market, market access, reducing tariffs, avoiding quantitative restrictions, both on the import side and on the export side is very important. But what sometimes is more important is the rule book that goes with that, that ensures a sort of more level playing field. And you know, this is what the World Trade Organization should be in the future. But the truth is that for the moment, uh, the World Trade Organization is still trying to address trade issues, uh, the agenda of which was built uh, in the 90s. And for a variety of reasons, which have to do with the political problems at home, our members are not yet in a position to conclude this big negotiation. But what happens in this region, again, should tell us something about the future. What really matters, if you want to open trade and to uh, benefit from the sort of welfare impact of opening trade, you have to cope about new issues, which are mostly non-tariff barriers, huh? food safety requirements, certification requirements. And this is something which we will need to do in the future. And this region, again, probably uh, tells us uh, the direction uh, where to go, which also means that what has been done regionally here in the future will have to be multilateralized. And that's an issue which I think we will have to address. One more reason to try and conclude, difficult as it is because of classical problems of vested interest resistances, which trade opening creates everywhere, one more reason to try and conclude this negotiation. We know now that contrary to what the G20 uh, said last year, it will not happen this year, basically because of a huge difference in uh, positions uh, between uh, U.S. on one side and emerging countries on the other side on one of the issues, which is industrial tariff reduction. For the moment, there is no way this big difference can be bridged. So in the meantime, what we are trying to do, and I'm not sure it will work, is try and extract a part of the Doha agenda, the one that is mostly focused to poor developing countries' benefits, and to see whether a sort of early harvest which would address specifically these developed countries' interests, plus maybe a few other topics like this huge trade facilitation agreement which we negotiated in WTO, whether this could be uh, agreed uh, before the end of the year. Still too soon to say whether it will float, but I think the two options we had were wait for the hope that uh, 
political stance could be uh, better aligned in the future depending on uh, electoral cycles here and there, or resequence the negotiation in trying to front load part of the benefits that will uh, come from this negotiation, and that's the option which for the moment we are testing. Thank you, Bhaskar. Mrs. Mustiavan, from an Indonesian point of view, what is your main, I mean, you are an Indonesian top business leader, what is your conclusion, what do you take out? I think uh, being the first uh, uh, web being held in Jakarta, the takeaways uh, from the energy sector in terms of the uh, 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 building the architecture of the energy in Asia, we have defined that uh, technology is one of the, of the uh, things that we need to pursue. Uh, so uh, the triangle will be energy, um, 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 the, uh, the energy and the competitiveness and also the environment. Underlying it will be the, uh, the technology. But for the uh, investments to come in into, for the oil and gas industry will be also another triangle, which is the, uh, uh, the investors, the government, and the community. And underlying it is the social contracts. That's a takeaway for, for me, from the energy sector. Thank you. Dominic, from uh, the point of view of the service sector and your personal takeaway from this meeting. It, I find it difficult to pick one thing, but I, yeah. I, the sort of one word that comes to mind is optimistic. I mean, with all of these issues and risks that are going on, I think there's a lot that we can take from Asia, as Pascal Lamy mentioned, not only in trade, but I think there's a lot of uh, wonderful examples here. We don't need to look to other regions to figure out how to do it. And if you look at topics like uh, infrastructure reform, a lot of that, no one knows how to make that work exactly perfectly, including in the U.S. and other countries, there's, they said, $8 trillion of need. There's ways to share that across the region in terms of how to do that effectively. Uh, education, I look at public sector reform, which we haven't spent a huge amount of time on in the broader groups, but it has been in some of the smaller groups. There's incredible examples globally from this part of the world, Thailand, for example, uh, Malaysia uh, being beacons in a way of what governments and other parts can do. So I, I guess the overall feeling is that I think Asia uh, has the, the right to and, and has the examples to sort of lead in how we can work in this uh, new globalism that was, that was talked about. Yeah. Stuart, as a, yeah, as a banker. Um, I, I share some of Dominic's thoughts, which is there is um, some optimism around a recognition of the steps that need to be taken in order to fund the infrastructure development that I think everybody would be of, the, of a view is necessary here in Indonesia to free up the bottlenecks and let the economy to continue to grow. And those kind of changes require financial market development uh, as well as changes to the approval process, as well as changes to title to land, but particularly the development effectively of a pension and insurance industry so you get the longer duration assets to fund it. And there's a sense and a recognition across both the private sector and the government that that's what's necessary to happen. I mean, our own view is that Indonesia is on the cusp of being upgraded to investment grade, mm -hmm. and it's those kind of changes that need to take place to actually achieve mm -hmm. that. And I think we're, I'm certainly encouraged by the recognition from the, the government um, ministers who I've met that actually that road is recognized and those changes are seen as necessary as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, we did uh, mainly food security, uh, not a small topic, and obviously a multidimensional a world that already uses uh, 1.3 times its resources than it can replenish, uh, a world that has over a billion people now uh, suffering from malnutrition and the numbers going up again, is not a world that we obviously uh, want to live in. And uh, as the Chinese say, if we don't change direction, we likely end up where we're going. So what it requires of us is uh, different business models, uh, different uh, ways of working, and that is what we concentrated on this, uh, this, uh, these last few days. Uh, next to the enormous hospitality of the uh, Indonesians and the Indonesian government, which is obviously the thing that we would like to recognize first and foremost, I'd say there are three brief conclusions, Klaus. Uh, the first one is, like my previous speakers, one of uh, positiveness and hope. Uh, the president talked about that on pro-growth, pro-pure, uh, poor, and pro-sustainability. And I think uh, we've seen many examples during the last few days, concrete examples also of the uh, Indonesian government and the other uh, countries in, in the Southeast Asia that uh, are represented here at the summit 
that uh, it's not only words but many actions as well. So I'm encouraged by that. Uh, the second one is a message of uh, partnership and trust. It's uh, very clear that uh, we cannot um, solve it individually or uh, sectorial or antagonistically and the concept of partnership, trust, uh, transparency is uh, clearly coming through and the third message is uh, start now. I was very encouraged by concrete examples that we have in the areas of new vision of agriculture which is sponsored by the WEF where there are concrete projects in Vietnam. Uh, now the Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture Initiative that Minister Bayo has launched during this conference, 14 companies have signed up. Other countries in Southeast Asia are committed to learn from these things and also expand it in their countries. Sustainable consumption, smallhold farmers are at the roots of this, absolutely needed for food security. The second one we worked is a uh, more difficult thing. It's the one billion that are not being cut today and that is actually going up. 600, by the way, 600 million are in this region. We launched this morning project Laser Beam, again a project in this case in West Timor, <coughs> people with less than two dollars a day, with the government an accelerated growth plan, with the World Food Program and many companies including Indonesian companies signing up to concentrate their efforts in that area to hopefully lift these people out of poverty uh, more than just uh, feeding them for the rest of their lives. Very encouraged by that. And then the last thing, Indonesia very fortunately is one of the G20 countries and rightfully so. Uh, Klaus, we've been working hard also again with mm -hmm. the government to provide some input to the debates that are happening and uh, as you know the next mm -hmm. meeting is the 25th and 26th yeah. in Paris. So again a, a, an initiative sponsored by the WEF that we were happy to put into concrete action here. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm, I'm particularly encouraged by what you are saying because it shows this is not only a meeting, this is a catalyst for action, uh, for initiatives, and particularly taking up what has been mentioned before for public-private partnerships. So um, if you take the um, CHC high technology point of view, what is your um, take home value? My take Take points, okay, having discussion with various people through the web as well, talking to uh, ministers and government officials, uh, is that, okay, uh, despite the fact that Indonesia has uh, grown tremendously over the last uh, decade, benefiting from the, 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 the economic growth of the world, I, I, I felt that this is my personal felt, okay, having the discussion, reading between the lines, is that uh, people are worried about seeing the rapid changes in the world. Uh, the technology is making these changes happening even at a faster rate, uh, despite the fact that this technology in, other, in certain parts of the world are creating tremendous wealth. At the same time, this technology also uh, uh, creating uh, 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 we can creating unique challenges to, to many countries, uh, such as okay, creating more transparency, creating uh, 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 uneven wealth distributions, uh, uh, and sometimes even creating revolutions in other parts of the or the, uh, certain parts of the world. So, uh, so while Indonesia, for example, has been blessed with uh, strong natural resources. Uh, and young populations, they are creating okay, uh, uh, jobs. Okay. Uh, Indonesia also concerned about how to participate more in the world economy that is based on technology development. So there was a lot of questions on okay, how can we uh, 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 use technology to further enhance the growth, economic growth of Indonesia. And I, I felt that question related to to the concerns of, 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 of this, the, the things I just mentioned earlier. Uh, so, so uh, okay, you know, we have discussion obviously about that, okay, how to, we can, we can uh, uh, I made some suggestions on how we can uh, accelerate some of these yeah. uh, uh, economic developments that is based on technology in order to spur the innovations they will be they'll, uh, 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 in, in the economy that is traditionally based on 
on mining, so agriculture, so yeah. any other types of uh, other industries. So this is this is an exciting challenge that I think that that, that they can be, that, that that we all have to face. Uh, uh, it is not an easy things to solve, mm -hmm. but but I think through the partnerships of of uh, private industries and uh, gov uh, and, and governments, we could actually uh, learn from some things that, uh, from other countries such as uh, China, for example, so on how they lure uh, multinational companies to China uh, to develop the economy that is based mm -hmm. on manufacturing. <clears throat> so some of these things I think could be good for further discussions down the road. Seat, you, you uh, made a recommendation and we, we shared our conclusions. I may ask the other panelists, panelists if you had a recommendation, uh, what would be your recommendation? Which uh, still, um, uh, let's say, you feel should come out? Uh, you made already one. <laughs> okay, right. I come back to you. Okay, but who, what, any recommendations to be made? I see some of the ministers uh, sitting in here. No recommendation? I think I'll, I'll speak from, from the energy sector. Uh, we did have discussions on you know, how to move forward on the alternative energy, and uh, we, 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 uh, we, uh, we have discussions with the, uh, the ministers as well from the uh, other uh, countries from the uh, from the region, and I think we need to uh, be brave enough to to take one alternative energy uh, as the uh, uh, as the branding for for you know to move forward. Uh, I think uh, we have discussions uh, you know with uh, Thailand and also with Malaysia and Indonesia how to to get this action plan moving forward so that. This, uh, this region can be considered not only for a food security, but also for energy security, but from non-fossil, an uh, another uh, uh, alternative energy. Dominic, any recommendations? Yeah, well, one thing I would say is reference cases. If we could, if again, I take the infrastructure, and I defer to Stuart more on this, but if we could pick one uh, example and make it work from a speed have the financing and use that as an example versus working on 25. So in a number of these areas, pick one and make it work right and then replicate it. Paul? Yeah, I'd agree with that. This part of the world has a unique opportunity. For companies like ours and, and looking at the total world, 70, 80 percent of the growth is happening here. And it still has to be invented to some extent, much like you see in places like China for getting the landline and moving directly to um, mobile phones. You see the same happening here in technology and other adoptions. So as we talk about doing things differently and looking at sustainable consumption to feed the world, this part of the world can actually set an example. If you look at Indonesia itself, where we are uh, kindly being hosted for their food supply, or if you look at the whole issues of deforestation and sustainable forestry, we can set standards that are the example for the rest of the world. And we can invent them now, not only for moral and ethical reasons, to just simply do the right thing, but also for competitive reasons, I believe, where we show that we have a future, not only short term, but for many years to come. And if we can work that together constructively as we move forward on some of these projects, I think we not only do ourselves a favor, but we do it also for our future generations. Thank you. Stuart, do you have any? I just think it's really important that we take it from a discussion to actually operationalizing some of this. There is obviously a crying need for infrastructure here. There are very clear ways to build the financial structures required to underpin the building of roads, bridges, power. Uh, and to Dominic's point, rather than boil the ocean dry, I think if we pick one or two yeah. and actually create real life working examples of the private sector working with government here to do it, then we've got some concrete results to show for the discussions that we've yeah. had. Because my fear would be that post this, as everybody leaves, it becomes condemned to a jolly nice discussion as opposed to public and private sector trying to work together to overcome some of the obstacles. And there are clear examples from other Asian countries as to how you can do this kind of thing. Yeah. We had um, as a theme towards a new globalism and I was looking um, 
into the definition. Uh, the word was uh, first used by the president of Indonesia when he came to Davos. So I was uh, curious what is the difference between globalization and globalism. And, uh, globalization is a process. Uh, globalism means to have your own identity, but to submit your own identity to global needs. Now, what, um, Pascal, I, I would ask you, how would you define globalism? And afterwards, I will ask each of the panelists to take up maybe one issue which hasn't been yet discussed in depth during the last 36 hours. Well, that's a formidably uh, difficult uh, question, Klaus. Uh, I think what's missing is not the reality of globalism. We know we now live in a global world <coughs> which is more and more interconnected we know that issues like environment, uh, migration, uh, human rights, uh, cyber security are global issues. So the reality is there, but our own capacity to think this reality is not there. So you can define globalism in describing the planet we live in, but you cannot define globalism from the traditional national way of looking at identities and belongings. Uh, what, what, what binds citizens of one country together? What binds them is basically trust. They trust their co-nationals more than they trust the foreigners. That's a reality. Now, why is it so? Because they share an identity which is made of values, culture, symbols, beliefs, uh, which are sort of specific to each country and uh, each nation. Now, what we need to do, in my view, if we want to harness globalization, if we want to adjust our way of governing globalization, our way of thinking it, what we need and what's missing is the sort of value platform that should bind us together explicitly. And sort of, you know, if I had a sort of a fairy wish to make, would be that uh, the G20, for instance, or the UN system, instead of spending hours of bureaucratic preparation on very complex topics, have a serious discussion about what binds us together. Now, we had that after the Second World War. The organization of the international system, which dates from the Second World War, was based on the sort of platform of values, UN Charter, and what goes with that. But the reality is that these values were Western values. And for many emerging countries on this planet, they don't really own them they were not really part of the serious discussion that took place in expliciting what values bind us together. So if, if you look at this issue of you know, globalization, globalism, uh, my sense is that we'd better focus more attention on the sort of basement of this institutional international system, we spend a lot of time, and true, there's a lot to do to make sure that uh, 
international uh, governance systems are more coherent, which, by the way, has a lot to do with whether countries are coherent or not in the various remits of this international system. But I think in doing so, we remain within the street lap. <clears throat> My advice would be, let's try and open a more philosophical, ideological debate that then, if there is convergence and agreement, would give the necessary legitimacy to international issues as opposed to the one they have. The reality, we all know it, we've got global problems, we've got local politicians. And we have local politicians because where they are accountable is to their own population. Now, how do we create a sense of global belonging that would then help building sort of a global legitimacy, uh, that, I think, remains to be done. And I think a country like Indonesia, uh, with its huge diversity, is in many ways a good example of how this can be done progressively. Uh, but the reality is that this necessitates a debate which I'm afraid for the moment is taking place nowhere. Let's stay in this context of um, globalism, regionalism, and nationalism. Now, natural resources, um, Mrs. Rustiavan, um, are unevenly distributed. How do you, and, and we all should have access to it, and we know that we will probably live in a time of resource scarcity. Now, how do you see the whole complex of natural resources in this, inside this framework of globalism, regionalism, and uh, nationalism? Thank you. Uh, I think I, I do agree with, uh, with the uh, uh, understanding of globalism. I think before we start going to uh, be fully uh, uh, globalized, we need to start uh, from what we have in the country and then from what we have in the region and come to one consensus. You know, I think being able to come with one consensus, then we can able to help the other parts of the region. But not until then, then I, uh, you know, globalism I, uh, I see as a face-to-face -face approach. Uh, I think uh, in, in this forum, we've identified you know, how we can move forward in terms of uh, you know, uh, resource balancing, natural resource balancing. And, but we need to be very transparent of all the energy balances that we have in this region mm -hmm. and what are the gaps and how can we each, each of the country can uh, fill in the gaps and what are resources that is you know, uh, 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 successive in, in, in these countries that we can help the other parts of the world. So until then, you know, we need to have an open dialogue between the countries in, the, in this region. You know, what is the energy balance in each of the country? And where in each of, be it a fossil or non-fossil, that we can develop together and optimize what we have. But Paul, some countries have no access to certain resources, so a national policy will not succeed in any case because there is such a uh, like um, I mean, energy, uh, maybe water, and so on. How, how do you see this scarcity in this new uh, uh, context of globalism? Yeah, and, and especially where the growth is, is in, is in the areas where you have the scarcity of, of water or food or the, the full effects of climate change. And uh, with the events in the Middle East, which to some extent I call it the revolution of the Internet, but it started with food crises. So the issue is pertinent. I had the benefit of thinking for two seconds when Pascal was, was talking, and, and it is an interconnected world. So I wrote down that this globalism to me is about shared responsibilities, and that goes beyond boundaries. Shared responsibilities for equitable and sustainable growth, but respecting the local solutions and respecting everybody involved. So if we can get that equitable and sustainable growth with respect and local solutions, but if we take co-responsibility of that beyond our boundaries, that requires the common values that you talked about. And I think in a company like ours, for example, that operates in 180 countries, I'm amazed when I go around the world how common values are the glue that make us successful. 
If we would do that with rules and laws and regulations, we'd probably stifle innovation and be out of business by now. So I firmly believe that these common values permeate many other things and we should leverage them more and talk to them more. But I also want to use this opportunity to say that it requires courage. It requires courage to finish Doha rounds. It requires courage to have climate change agreements. It requires courage to make international institutions work. And likewise, for companies like ours, it requires courage to be part of these solutions, even if it doesn't mean a gain to the bottom line in the next six or nine months. And that's why a company like Unilever, we put out a vision to double our turnover. We want to grow. We want to help in that prosperity creation. But we want to decouple that from environmental impact. We don't have all the answers. We certainly need to do it in partnership. But it is that courage that we need to put other business models out there. We have these values and that courage. I think we can get to that new globalism that yeah. you're seeking that, uh, that hopefully gives us that better world we're after. Pascal, if I take what Paul said, and uh, I mean, you have three key words. It's sustainability, inclusion, and partnership. Are those the pillars of uh, the shared values? Yeah, although these are words and concepts uh, which uh, everybody can agree with, but with, I'm not sure, the same understanding of what it means. Uh, so it's, it's a useful approximation, but at the end of the day, I think we have to go back to very fundamental uh, issues like you know, freedom, security, human rights, environmental sustainability, and my own experience in discussing this with many people on this planet is that what we've had until now, which is the sort of prominence of Western values and the sort of Western civilization, will not be enough. We have to enter into deeper discussions, I wouldn't say negotiations, because negotiating values is uh, philosophically suspect, but with you know, churches, civil societies, different philosophies, in order to dig a bit under these global notions of uh, sustainability, uh, partnership. Uh, and that's, that's difficult to make, huh? because depending on where you come from, uh, you know, if you come from a Western philosophical matrix, individual freedom is the number one. If you come from a Confucianist matrix, collective positive results is the number one. Now, how do you adjust this into something which would be of a more global nature is for sure different. Huh? And you just took the example of uh, natural resources. Huh? The truth is that uh, because of nature and history, the musical chairs uh, have unevenly distributed natural resources on this planet. And there is a sort of distribution problem. The normal solution to that, you know, is markets. Uh, if there is scarcity, if there is an imbalance between supply and demand, this should lead to a price that reflects this scarcity. Now, once you've done that, you haven't addressed the problems of trade in raw materials today, whether it's energy, whether it's food, we all know that markets do not price scarcity, for instance, in energy, to the environmental externality which energy consumption results in. Well, if you want to address this, you will have to have a fundamental agreement that access to natural resources should be free. 
Is this an easy concept to agree on? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so those are, in my view, the sort of questions which, again, are below the sort of usual discussions on global governance, but which at the end of the day matter because if individuals do not agree with a sort of this basic set of value, their governments will be weak in international negotiations. And we need strong governments in international negotiations. So this legitimacy issue, in my view, needs to be taken up uh, more clearly and uh, in a way more energetically. We have made a kind of very important excursion into the philosophical framework. Let me come back now more to the business side. And when you look at the new globalism, there are three, three uh, issues which really uh, come to my mind which have changed. And I think we have three uh, people here on the podium who can best respond to those issues. So first is we, and now our whole assumption of global competition and the world economic forum is very much involved, was based on, on the one hand, high quality, high cost, and on the other hand, uh, low innovation, low cost um, countries. And this is completely changing now. Now I would like to, to know from you, um, Dominic, um, how does this uh, translate into the new globalism? I have a similar question uh, to, um, uh, which goes into the same uh, direction. We were used that, uh, in, um, that we had in the East high savings um, and we had in the West, I simplify matters, high debts and high consumption. Now, can this be sustained and in, in a new globalism? Don't we have to change it? And finally, uh, I think we have this issue of uh, our world was very much based, we spoke about markets, but it was also very much based on intellectual property. Now we go into a situation where everybody knows everything. So we have three people, and Dominic, do you want to start with the first one? Oh. We see change in the paradigms for global competition. I'll try. We have a very deep conversation up here. I'm still reflecting on what uh, Pascal talked about in values. But I do, I, I do think that the I have to try and simplify it for my own simple mind, but the, I do think the world has become more complex where we used to have the model of, you know, the, the East was the export manufacturing place, low cost labor going to the West with the consumers. And I think that's definitely over. And we're seeing an incredible amount of innovation that's actually occurring in the East, even in places like Morocco, where we would never, you, would, you wouldn't imagine this with technology and all of the changes, that's all changing. I think we're also seeing within countries differences. I think you could also argue that cities are becoming more of the competitive landscape than countries. I mean, there's as much difference within China uh, between the coastal cities and the tier four cities than, uh, you know, within even, in, I would argue, parts of the United States. And so the, the, the thing I think about is that, number one, let's recognize that it's a very different world and the actors in it are also thinking more broadly. They have much more degrees of freedom. And if I just think about companies, they're not thinking about national boundaries anymore. They're, they're looking at where can I do innovation the best? Where can I uh, find my lowest cost manufacturing? Where, where is my supply chain going to be? And they are just much more flexible and distributed than they ever have been. And one of the consequences of that, I get to the shared responsibility on globalization is the safety nets that used to be in the case in, in countries are no longer valid because if I decide to, to um, fire people in Boston where we have a research center and build it in Poland, I just do it. I'm not, but if I, I need to start thinking as a corporation about the shared responsibility and how that moves because the disruptions 
are now being held in the national level, but they're, and so I think this, our institutions are not fit for, for purpose uh, on that side. Stuart, um, this paradigm in the financial world has to change. I think everybody agrees. But can we do it without any further disruptions uh, and systemic risks of the whole financial system? You are probably best apt to give an answer to this question because if I'm not mistaken, you are the bank with most, uh, which is most spread in the world in terms of uh, local um, implantations. No, we are. We are. Um, I mean, I think in a way we've, we're almost at, we've gone through two stages from a financial markets point of view. The first stage was probably Western industrial companies seeking cheaper labor in the emerging markets to sell their products still in the West. Stage two was as you just described, which is local companies in the emerging markets effectively selling consumer products to the West and in essence providing what could be described on a national scale as vendor finance. I mean, in essence, the Eastern countries with very high savings rates have in essence financed the Western countries either at national level and then ultimately a consumer level to buy their products. So it's a very large piece of vendor finance. Um, and actually it is at the root of the financial crisis or part of the many causes of the financial crisis that we've just been through is this very significant global imbalance of, of the East being a huge creditor to the West. That clearly isn't sustainable because it hasn't been sustainable because we've just been through a significant financial crisis which has really been a Western financial crisis. I mean, it really has impacted the UK and the United States primarily. And the impacts back into Asia have been a second order impact. It's really been, again, about the globalization of investment flows. So, so that model, I don't think, is sustainable. And I think that you can see evidence of, of shifts taking place. Just the very enlargement of you know, G7, G8 to G20 reflects the fact that the creditor nations are now in the, what has been historically described as the emerging markets, but probably should be described as the faster growing markets. And the West needs to start to move away from being consumer based. If you think of a journey, and this is probably best shown in terms of China, China's trying to transition from being an export dominated economy to build a domestic infrastructure, and now infrastructure is probably 50% of GDP, to eventually emerging as a continental economy with actually a domestic consumption that takes place within a continental economy. It won't unhook itself from exports because the world is now structurally imbalanced because everybody for the last 30 years has followed the competitive advantage of nations. And so individual nations can't retreat behind domestic barriers because nobody is self-sustaining in every single industry. You know, it, it is the case possibly in the UK, there isn't a car industry anymore, so you, know, you would have to import. Um, you, you, that competitive advantage of nations has resulted in now, if you like, permanent barriers where world trade has to take place. And if you look at the capital imbalances, the deposits in the banking system of the world generally sit in China, Japan, and Germany, and the shortfall sits in places like the United States. So that capital imbalance cannot be solved again by protectionism, either at a capital flow level or, or indeed at a trade level. But, but I do think what will happen is as the Asian countries march through this transition from being export-led to creating a more balanced economic model, of course, a large part of the surpluses that exist will get recycled in Asia. One, one of the odd ironies, of course, is that the Asian central banks and sovereign wealth funds choose not to develop the bond markets and domestic infrastructure of their own countries but actually those of the Western nations. And ultimately, that probably has to change and that capital needs to be redeployed in their own countries. That does force a contraction in the West as savings rates have to come back up. So, so I think there's a very difficult journey actually to take place because the structural imbalance that is in part the cause of the financial crisis came about over a number of years and it's going to be very hard to unwind in anything over a number of years. And, and the risk is therefore we have a prolonged period in the West of almost stagflation. So high inflation coming from energy prices and, and food prices, but low GDP growth as that transition sort of starts to take place. I may, I may add a question here. What does it mean for the monetary system? I think, I think what it, it, it doesn't, I don't think it does mean that you could go back to a Bretton Woods type of situation. I think the world is too 
complicated and capital flows too freely with the information technology advances that we have now compared to the Bretton Woods. You've got instant information and price discovery around the world. What, what I think it does mean for central banks, particularly in the West, is that they need to take a lesson out of the book of the central banks in Asia and use a lot more macro prudential tools mm -hmm. and not just rely on monetary policy and the capital ratios for their financial systems, but to be involved in prescription as to how much you can lend against property, the mix of portfolios within banks, cash reserve requirements, yeah. et cetera, which Asian central banks learnt well in the 97, 98 financial crisis. And the Western central banks re re continue to rely on the blunt instrument of the official <laughs> interest rate and the capital within their yeah. banking system rather than the kind of macro prudential tool tools that Asian central banks have used extensively since the 97, 98 crisis. We are coming uh, to an end, but say a, a really short comment. Can innovation survive without intellectual protection? Well, uh, I consider intellectual properties, or what you can call it, know-hows, uh, to be just yet a, a different kinds of natural resources. Uh, the traditional natural resources, like having gold or so coppers in, in your land is something that you're blessed with because you happen to be there. Uh, there are other parts of the world where they don't have so much of natural resources, such as maybe Taiwan or Japan, but they do have uh, other types of natural resources, which is called human capital. And you can use human capital to do nothing, or you can ha use human capital to to produce something out of nothing, uh, and that's called intellectual properties, know-how. So uh, it turns out that people are starting to realize globally that this know-how, this intellectual property, after all, is a very valuable resource. Uh, it may be even more valuable than just the traditional uh, in, uh, 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 natural resources or, you know, or water resources, or maybe I shouldn't say it's more valuable, just it's as valuable. Uh, so what we're seeing around the world, uh, countries are starting to realize that they need to create this new kind of natural, new kind, maybe not so new kind, okay. Re okay, new founded refounded natural resources called intellectual property. So you're seeing countries like China so, uh, investing heavily in universities uh, to develop new tech, uh, to develop internal technology. Uh, you've seen already in Taiwan, for example, the last 30 years where government invested in uh, 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 semiconductor industries to spur the, the Taiwanese uh, semiconductor manufacturing. And it turns out that okay, this, this, this natural, this, uh, this intellectual property has a different property. Well, okay, when you have natural, the standard natural resources, as you use it, you deplete the natural resource. But when you're talking about this intellectual property, as you build new intellectual property, you create magnets of okay, uh, other people to come to create even more intellectual property, even more know-how. So it creates the positive feedbacks of be building more things out of, again, of nothing. So I think globally people are starting to realize that this is an important area to invest. People are trying to grab the, the claim that they are the one that are developing this know-how, fighting for the, for, the, for, the, for the stake, okay, for the claim that they are, that they are the one that developed this technology. So this is probably the next battle of the, uh, the next decade on how to get this who, who, who can get, grab the best, I mean, the most out of these uh, resources. We had a great panel. We had great co-chairs. Um, I think in this last uh, session, we took up some of the issues, um, not only as conclusions, but we added some new points of view. I, if in one sentence, listening to what you've just heard. Do you have any comment, Pascal? Before I give the floor to the Prime Minister? 
I think it would be more prudent to give the floor to the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> no. What, what we just heard, including this uh, last uh, pitch on uh, intellectual property, which, by the way, did not, if, I'm, if I listen correctly, uh, address the essential problem, which is how much intellectual property should be protected. And uh, if we agree that uh, natural resources should be accessible, why don't we agree that intellectual property should be accessible? The big difference is that in one case, God gave you your natural resources. In the other case, you had to invest to get there. And that there is a price for investment and then you know, there is a bit of a return. But you know, I think th this goes back again to this tension between the efficiency of globalization, which is in a way nothing more than one more face of technology driven uh, sort of market capitalism expansion on the one side and on the other side feelings of people uh, and how do you reconcile these two things because there are different individual feelings about these things is something which uh, I think remains to be done you know, I don't think deglobalization would work nor, by the way, do I believe uh, it should work. And on this, I'm very much in agreement with what the President uh, said yesterday. But nevertheless, we have to care about these sort of feelings that globalization may not work for people. And that's something which uh, I think remains a question mark on which we haven't yet found uh, the right answer. It's good that we do not have uh, answers to all questions because then we wouldn't need any meetings anymore, you see. <laughs> so please join me in uh, thanking Pascal Lamy and our co-chairs and please welcome uh, Prime Minister Abhijit here on the stage. Well, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is for me to be here. Although if they say uh, all politics is local, during the very deep discussions about globalism, I was wondering whether I was in the right place. But I'm convinced that I am for two reasons. First of all, I am pleased to be here in Indonesia. If you go out into the lobby, there's a black and white photo of a much younger version of myself <laughs> participating in the East Asia Forum in 1998. Then both Indonesia and Thailand were suffering from one of the biggest crises we faced in our generation. Uh, we in Thailand, in fact, suffer double-digit contraction and the, the reason I'm pleased to be here is to witness what has happened since then in Indonesia. A remarkable turnaround with structural reforms in the economy and also remarkable progress in democratization. That's certainly a good reason to be here to, be, to witness the success and the remarkable um, progress that has been achieved over this last decade. The second reason I'm convinced I'm right to, uh, to be here is that we are discussing the issue of globalism and the Thai people, the Thai government also want to make our contributions to the region and indeed to meet global challenges. At the same time, despite the fact that we are in the midst of an election, many of you here will also have remarkable influence on the lives of the Thai people over the next four years. It's not just about the Thai government, it's not just about the political, the domestic political process that will determine the future of our people. So when a question was asked 
about the difference between globalization and globalism. Let me offer my own version of an answer. I think globalization has been a process driven by technological changes, driven by market forces, and for so many of us, and particularly for our peoples, we have been almost like passive observers on the receiving end of this remarkable process. Some positive impact, obviously, new opportunities, more wealth, but at the same time, incredible challenges that have emerged. And today, we are discussing issues about fairness, about sustainability, about balance. And globalism is really about how we can now actively respond to that process that we have been passively almost been witnesses or victims of. And so I think we're certainly on to something when we talk about shared responsibilities and shared values as the key underpinning of this new globalism. And the global financial crisis, the recent contagious debt crisis in Europe, clearly have reminded us of the new global realities. And we are reminded that as a global community, we need to find a solution that requires global cooperation and coordination. We have not yet been able to achieve the kind of institutionalization of this global cooperation. The G20 has emerged not through formal rules, not through uh, formal agreements, but have been uh, a very responsive and timely um, answer to the crisis that we faced then. So therefore today, what we are facing is to find solutions to those challenges that I've mentioned. How to achieve greater balance, how to achieve fairness, and how to achieve sustainability. And we cannot get around this problem unless we tackle head-on the issue of global governance. I'm sure that uh, Pascal has been very much frustrated by what he wants to achieve given the inheritance of the old rules, the old structures, the old institutions as far as global politics is concerned that we inherited from the last century, but yet uh, having to meet the challenges of this century. And it's clear that if we are going to create this new globalism, we have to aim for reform of a fair and equitable rule of the games and the global governance system that really reflects the new realities. And we are here in East Asia, where we feel that uh, our voice needs to be heard and that we should have a fairer representation given the influence, given the economic powers that we are now enjoying in this region. Which is why I think it's very important that uh, this new global governance system reform takes shape. And indeed, uh, I would support Pascal's idea that it has to come with a clear focus on what kind of values that we share, which can move this reform process forward. But equally important is that the process of regional and national development also needs to respond to the challenges. How to make growth inclusive and how to make growth sustainable. And here again, I think we have to find new models for growth and new ways of working with one another. Professor Schwab mentioned a third word when he talked about uh, globalism. It wasn't just inclusiveness but sustainable or, or sustainability, but the word partnership. And again, it's clear that during the discussions in this session, and I'm sure over the last 36 hours, we've also been talking about some realities and lessons that we've learned. Yes, the market system continues to be a powerful force, and a force that, if used constructively, can also answer many of the challenges, whether it's the issue of efficiency, of uh, uh, providing incentives for innovation, technology, which some of the panelists have referred to. But there are also clear limits as to what the market can achieve. But in the old days, we left what the market couldn't achieve to governments. And we've also discovered that governments by themselves cannot provide all the answers. 
which is why when we discuss today about the issue of inequality, when we discuss about issues of balance or sustainability, we do not think that we can find answers just simply in more regulations, in more taxes and spending by the government, or even laws. But we think more about how the public and private sectors must work together to make sure that we have a form of growth or a model of growth that is pro-inclusion of people, pro-balance, and pro-sustainability. And for us in Thailand, we have embarked upon this new growth model. We place people at the center of our development. We feel that the creation of opportunities and the creation of sufficient safety nets is what will enable and empower people, whether they are in the private or the public sectors, to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. We place high importance on enabling social policies so that equality of opportunity can be ensured and growth would not benefit just certain parts of society. And we have to take that special care uh, for the poor and the vulnerable in one way or another by also asking not just uh, the private sector, the business sector, but also civil society to work together towards new forms and new models of business as well. I'm not just talking about uh, corporate social responsibility, but also I'm referring to the growth of social enterprises and also a number of initiatives that now the government and the private sector are working together in Thailand, for instance, on the issue of the fight against corruption. And let me also say that uh, all we are doing is very much in line with the sufficiency economy philosophy of His Majesty the King of Thailand, where there is emphasis on moderation and reasonableness. We've talked about the Asian economies being surplus economies, accumulating wealth, perhaps by producing too much and consuming too little, and not yet using those savings for the benefits of our people in terms of building infrastructure and the welfare system. We need to do that now. But we must also fall into the trap that I think the economies that developed before us went into. Either building an unsustained model of a welfare system where there was too much reliance on taxes. Instead, I think in Asia, we should tap into the culture of high savings to make sure that people also contribute to the building up of this welfare system and safety net. We mustn't fall into the same trap of encouraging our people to overconsume and become deficit countries, but rather place emphasis on moderation and reasonableness, as I've mentioned, as a key part of the sufficiency economy philosophy. So Thailand has experienced a series of unprecedented challenges in the last few years, but as the figures speak for themselves, we have proven that the Thai economy is robust and resilient. And even despite the political troubles, differences that we've been through, economic development remains our shared goal. And it's our determination to achieve this prosperity on the basis of inclusiveness and sustainable development with quality of life for all. So we are also intent upon contributing to sustainable global recovery. With the general election scheduled in the, on the 3rd of July, we are also at an important juncture. But whatever the results of the elections, the World Economic Forum on East Asia for next year is set on our program. I'm pleased to be able to extend a very warm invitation of the Royal Thai government and our people to all of you to visit Thailand, to deliberate on the challenges that we have begun our discussions today, and for you to see for yourselves the potential Thailand can offer as your reliable business and global partners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Let me just... Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. This was a truly visionary and at the same time very pragmatic uh, speech. May I now ask Sushant Rao, who had the responsibility for this meeting, to close formally our World Economic Forum on East Asia 2011. 
Thank you, Professor Schwab. Thank you, participant. I'm going to follow the example set by the President of Indonesia last night in his remarks where he was asked by the First Lady to keep them short. So uh, even if I had more time to speak, uh, I don't know whether I could sufficiently express the impact of this year's East Asia meeting and the appreciation of the World Economic Forum for our partnership with Indonesia. I'll give one interpretation from my side on the new globalism. I think it's been described here as an imperative for collaboration and cooperation. And thanks to the co-chairs and all the participants, I think, who were very committed to improving the state of the world, this meeting produced many examples of collaboration between industry, government, and civil society leaders. I would, however, add to collaboration and cooperation a third imperative of connectivity. ASEAN is a region of the world which is a living example of it, a region of the world with such rich cultural, social, and religious diversity that nonetheless is working hand in hand toward economic integration in 2015. In Indonesia, my colleagues and I have been very fortunate to have been working hand in hand with our 16 member companies in Indonesia, the Office of the President, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Investment Coordinating Board, the Office of the Governor of Jakarta, but in particular, the Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Ministry of Trade. I would like to thank you very warmly for making us a part of Team Indonesia and for sharing with all the participants why this country is rightly referred to as remarkable Indonesia. Your team spirit, your hospitality, and your tireless engagement were truly remarkable. Your Excellency Prime Minister Abhisit, on behalf of my team and my colleagues, I'd also like to assure you that we will take this example set by Indonesia and work very hard for a similar success next year in Thailand. Ladies and gentlemen, co-chairs of the meeting, our friends in Indonesia, and all of my colleagues at the World Economic Forum, I think you will agree with me that after these past days in Jakarta, we all now feel a little bit more Indonesian. So I'd like to close in Bahasa Indonesian by saying, Terima kasih dan selamat jalan. Thank you. Very good.